so let's take this reading comprehension passage and uh, it is uh, from art and literary criticism uh, which is one of the most uh, common topics uh, that come in uh, cat reading comprehension so we will read the passage first and then we will go ahead and uh, take the questions on the left hand side of the screen you can see the passage and on the right hand side you can see the questions so let's read the passage first it says masterpieces are dumb wrote flobbert they have a tranquil aspect like the very products of nature like large animals and mountains he might have been thinking of war and peace that vast silent work unfathomable and simple provoking endless questions through the majesty of its being tolstoy's simplicity is overpowering says the critic bailey disconcerting because it comes from his casual assumption that the world is as he sees it like other 19th century russian writers he is impressive because he means what he says but he stands apart from all others and from the most western writers in his identity with life which is so complete as to make us forget that he's an artist he is the center of his work but his egocentricity is of a special kind getter for example says bailey cared for nothing but but himself tolstoy was nothing but himself when you read the first paragraph of the passage sometimes you might have you might feel like rereading the whole thing again so you can you always have a choice of rereading the passage but understand people that from the first paragraph we get to know that there are two words that dominate the passage one is of course masterpieces and uh, Uh, you have you have the word tolstoy coming in uh, every now and then you know the 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 author says that tolstoy's simplicity and tolstoy was nothing but himself he stands apart from the rest and then you have like other 19th century russian writers he is impressive because he again refers to tolstoy so because tolstoy means what he says he is the center of his work so when you when when you carefully scan uh, the, pa- the the paragraph you realize that the author seems to be focusing on tolstoy and the focus is tolstoy as a writer correct and that is where the word he keeps on coming and the word tolstoy keeps on coming but but he has not straight away gone into discussing tolstoy he says that masterpieces are done they have a tranquil aspect he might have been talking about war and peace right and how can this book be related to tolstoy that means tolstoy must have been the author of this book so this is what we call is connecting the dots you have to understand that in reading comprehension passages not everything is explicitly stated you have to connect the dots the author has not said that uh, tolstoy wrote war and peace war and peace is a silent word you know, not all those things he said that uh, masterpieces are dumb and uh, he might have been thinking of war and peace that vast silent work and provoking endless questions tolstoy simplicity is overpowering so this tolstoy simplicity can be connected with war and peace uh, by inferring that the yes, tolstoy must have been the author of war and peace so we get to know from the first paragraph that the author has introduced uh, tolstoy as a writer and he is impressive he says you know he says that he start he stands apart from the others and he's the center of his work so lots of things about tolstoy has come then further he says for all his varied modes of writing and the multiplicity of characters in his fiction tolstoy and his work are of a piece again the word tolstoy the famous conversion of his middle years movingly recounted in his confession was a culmination of his early spiritual life not a departure from it so confession must have been a book and he must have uh, uh, have uh, recounted um, the conversion of his middle years the apparently fundamental changes that led from epic narrative to dogmatic parable from a joyous buoyant attitude toward life to pessimism and cynicism from war and peace to croizer sonata came from the same less rest same restless impressionable depths of an independent spirit yearning to get at the truth of its experience truth is my hero wrote tolstoy reporting the fighting at sebastopol truth remained his hero his own not others truth others were awed by napoleon believed that a single man could change the destinies of nations adhered to meaningless rituals formed their tastes on established canons of art tolstoy reversed all preconceptions and in every reversal he threw the system the machine the externally ordained belief the conventional behavior so what you get a feeling is that the the author though he talks about war and peace at the start he gradually moves from war and peace to talking about tolstoy as a writer and then he says that tolstoy wrote this and he says that so basically what was tolstoy as a writer you know what kind of a writer he was that is the focus of 
of, of, the, of, the, of the passage so far. Let's go and take uh, the, the next paragraph. It says, in his work, the artificial and the genuine are always, uh, always exhibited in dramatic opposition, correct? And then it says further that the supposedly great Napoleon and the truly great uh, unregarded Captain Tushin or Nicholas Rostov actual experience in battle and his later account, account of it. The simple is always pitted against the elaborate knowledge gained from observation against assertions of borrowed faiths. Tolstoy's magical simplicity is a product of these tensions. His work is a record of the question. So lots of things has been given about Tolstoy and we know that Tolstoy seems to be the focus of the passage and uh, some of you might wonder whether the author, author is really positive about Tolstoy or negative or is he having mixed feelings about Tolstoy. Well, uh, you know, sometimes, uh, of course, the passage is full of, uh, full of adjectives which indicate the author's attitude. He is impressive, the author says. And then he says he stands apart from the others in his identity with life, which is so complete. So again, it's a positive thing. Then he says that, a buoyant attitude and then he says truth is my hero wrote Tolstoy reporting the fighting in Sebastopol truth remained his hero so when truth is my hero and truth remained his hero that means it is indeed a positive opinion which the author has given about Tolstoy he says that uh, others adhered to meaningless rituals formed their tastes on established canons of art Tolstoy reversed all preconceptions and in every reversal he overthrew the system the externally ordained belief, the conventional behavior in favor of impulsive life, of inward motivation and the solutions of independent thought. And then lots of things. So if you, if, if you, if you look at uh, Tolstoy wanted happiness, but only hard-won happiness, that emotional fulfillment and intellectual clarity, which could come only as a price of all-consuming effort. He scorned lesser satisfactions. So lots of, you know, if you look at the overall attitude of the author towards Tolstoy, definitely it is positive. You might find occasional words which are ambivalent, you know, when you say impulsive life. Impulsive life basically means a spontaneous life. The word impulsive doesn't mean that it is. it has to be negative always. Similarly, when you go up here in the first paragraph, you will find a few things which you might feel are negative. He says that, you know, his egocentricity is of a special kind. See, when you say that his egocentricity of a, is of a special kind, again, the author is not using the word ego in the conventional sense. The author says that, that Tolstoy is basically the center of his work. That means Tolstoy is writing what he feels is correct. He's not borrowing things from others. So you can in a way call it as egocentricity. But again, that egocentricity is in a positive way, not in a negative way. So overall, the author has portrayed uh, Tolstoy in a very positive light. And that is where we have the first question coming from. The first question says, which of the following best characterizes the author's attitude towards Tolstoy? So if you look at the options, and we have to be very careful with respect to what we pick as the right choice. And it says she deprecates, she finds his theatricality artificial, she admires, she thinks his inconsistency disturbing, so she respects his devotion to orthodoxy. Now, the, the, the problem is that there are a few options which are straight away positive. So, for example, uh, uh, C, C says she admires. So, this is a positive choice. So, if, we, if I have to, uh, you know, break it down, I would say this is a positive option. Then, uh, to deprecate basically means to bring the importance of. So, deprecate has come from the word depreciation, which means bringing down the value of. But uh, the author, uh, the author is not saying that she deprecates the cynicism of his later works. In fact, the later works have not been the focus of the passage, and the author has definitely not talked about Tolstoy's cynicism. The author has talked about Tolstoy's simplicity, the truthfulness. He said, "The truth is my hero." Truth remained his hero, you know. And then he said, "The simple is always pitted against the negative," right? So uh, the author is not talking about Tolstoy's cynicism. So A can definitely be ruled out. And then you say that she thinks his inconsistency disturbing. Now, the author is, I mean, uh, Tolstoy's inconsistency, uh, again, if you look at the word inconsistency, you have to go and check where exactly has the author pointed out that he is, or she, that, that Tolstoy is inconsistent. When you mark the answer for this question, you don't have to look for one or two sentences. You have to mark the option which is overall pointing at the attitude of the author. And the overall attitude is definitely very, very positive because it is clearly visible at many instances in the paragraph. And I have told you uh, that, that 
uh, that, that that Tolstoy led us uh, an impulsive life doesn't mean that that impulsive is negative. It means spontaneous. Tolstoy's egocentricity doesn't mean that egocentricity is a negative word. So you have to eliminate option A and option D. You're left with B, C, and E. Now she respects his devotion. Definitely, the author seems to be respecting. But what? His devotion to orthodoxy. But the problem is that Tolstoy is is not. Um, uh, in every reversal, look at this. In every reversal, he overthrew the system. So, if he's overthrowing the system and he's he's overthrowing the conventional behavior in favor of inward motivation, then how can you say that he's devoted to orthodoxy? In fact, Tolstoy is not devoted to orthodoxy. You have to clearly say that she is not devoted to orthodoxy. So, he goes out because Tolstoy is not orthodox. Tolstoy is a rebel. He is he's, he's he is favoring uh, uh, the the uh, the independent stuff in, fa uh, in uh, over uh, uh, the conventional stuff. So you are left with again two choices. There is she finds his theatricality artificial, and she admires. Of course, she wins the race. Why? Because she definitely is finding his uh, sincerity. Why sincerity? Because Tolstoy. When you say that 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 Tolstoy is the center of his work, that means Tolstoy writes what he feels is right. He cared for nothing but his own self. That means basically Tolstoy wants to say what he feels, not what others feel. He, truth was his, uh, his, his, his hero. And then everywhere the author says truth remained his hero. So that means can I say that the person who is truthful has to be sincere. And therefore she admires his wholehearted sincerity. Option C is the best choice. There is no better choice. Let's go ahead and take the second question. The second question says which of the following uh, best paraphrases the Flaubert's statement quoted in lines. So Flaubert's statement has come towards the start of the paragraph and uh, Flaubert says masterpieces are dumb, right? This is what Flaubert says. They have, uh, they have a tranquil... Uh, so Flaubert says masterpieces are dumb. They have a tranquil aspect like the very products of nature, like large animals and mountains. He might have been thinking of war and peace. Correct? So, so from this point, Bailey has come. Right? It is, says the critique Bailey. So that means we have to paraphrase what Flaubert has to say. And Flaubert says that masterpieces are dumb. They have a tranquil aspect like the very products of nature, like large animals and mountains. So the so Flaubert says that masterpieces are dumb. They have a tranquil aspect, and uh, uh, they uh, he might have been thinking of war and peace. It's vast, unfathomable, simple, provoking, endless questions through the majesty of its being. So let's go and check which of the following options best captures. We have to not capture, but we have to paraphrase. In a sense, we have to rephrase what Flaubert has to say. So A says masterpieces seem ordinary and unremarkable from the perspective of later age. Now you might feel that the word dumb is, def is a negative word, but again this is what happens when you take word for granted. Dumb basically means silent. Dumb also means stupid. But in what, in what context uh, Flaubert has used the phrase masterpieces are dumb? When you say masterpieces are dumb, the author wants to say they have a tranquil aspect like the very product of nature and further they provoke endless questions. So masterpieces, they, they, they provoke endless questions but they don't give answers to those questions. That is the reason why uh, they are dumb. So we have to understand it from the context point of view and uh, not just the other way. So look at this now, what it says. Masterpieces are dumb and they have, a, they have a tranquil aspect. But then if they are masterpieces, how can they be dumb? So masterpieces are not ordinary. Masterpieces are basically silent. They don't, uh, they, they, they don't speak much. So great works of art do not explain themselves to us any more than natural objects do. Now, when the author says do not explain themselves, that means they are dumb. You have to understand by using your own understanding. They will not explain to you everything. That's the reason why the author uh, Flaubert says here categorically, uh, if, if we move the passage here, Flaubert, it says here, masterpieces are dumb. They have a tranquil aspect like the very products of nature, like large animals and mountains. So the way, the way large animals and mountains and the great works of nature, they have a tranquil aspect. Masterpieces also have a tranquil aspect. They don't speak much about themselves. Therefore, B is the right choice because B is the exact paraphrasing of what has come. 
great works means masterpieces do not explain themselves basically means they are dumb and they are dumb uh, like natural objects like large animals mountains you know great natural objects they also don't explain themselves so b is a perfect paraphrasing so great works of art do not explain to us any more than do not explain themselves to us any more than so uh, they are, both are having similar uh, this this is what b says a says masterpieces are ordinary this is not what the author has in mind and c says important works of art take their place in the pageant of history because of their uniqueness but then the problem is is it about uniqueness the author has said that they are dumb and that basically means they don't speak that means they don't explain themselves they don't talk and they provoke endless questions understand this provoking endless questions basically means they trigger curiosity in you but they don't speak to you so you have to find the answer that is what the author means to say that they provoke endless questions uniqueness is not the uh, the, the the point that the author is making here that 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 flaubert is making here so see also goes out then you say the most important aspects of good art are the orderliness no many of you might feel like this could be a good choice but understand people flaubert has said masterpieces are dumb they they have a tranquil aspect and what you have come here you have said the most important aspects of good art who says that there is the most important aspects of good art and the orderliness and tranquility it reflects so the point here is they have a tranquil aspect so when you say that masterpieces are dumb in the sense that they don't explain themselves but what you have done here in option d is you have said the most important aspects of good art now the author has not said that uh, the most important aspect is tranquility and the orderliness first of all why orderliness so tranquility is fine but orderliness has come into picture secondly you say the most important who said this is the most important masterpieces are dumb that's it but dumbness is the most important quality tranquility is the most important quality it's not talked about see the point is you have to pick a choice which is matching with what is given in the passage so d again is not the right choice do not explain basically means they are they are not talking and they, they do not explain themselves why because they provoke endless questions and they are dumb so provoking endless questions and being dumb basically means they do not explain themselves and masterpieces which are enduring value represent they are not representing the forces of nature this is you are taking things literally so this also goes out b is the best choice and the right answer let's go and take the next question it says the author quotes from bailey to show that now why has uh, the author quoted bailey definitely the author has quoted bailey to talk positive about about tolstoy right and uh, if you look at bailey then what has bailey to say bailey says that uh, tolstoy's uh, is simplicity is overpowering so when something is overpowering that basically means that it is it is really surprising it is disconcerting why because 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 how can you the reason why it is disconcerting is because you get a feeling that how can someone be so simple so tolstoy's uh, simplicity is overpowering it is disconcerting why because it comes from his casual assumption that world is as he sees it like other 19th century russian writers he is impressive because he means what he what he says but he stands apart from all others and from most western writers in his identity with life which is so complete as to make us forget that he is an artist so he is the center of his work that means that tolstoy is the center of his work his sincerity is overpowering all these things are there so let's go and read the options option a says although tolstoy observes and interprets life he maintains no self conscious distance from of course Tolstoy is the center of his work that means he is not maintaining any self conscious distance from his experience that means Tolstoy's experience and what he writes are one and the same and that's why he maintains no self conscious distance so a can be a good choice look at b the realism of tolstoy's works gives the illusion that his novels are reports of actual uh it is not giving the illusion it is a reality Tolstoy's works are reports of actual events he is actually writing his own experience so it is not giving the illusion it is in fact the, the truth so illusion is opposite to truth so again the realism of Tolstoy's uh, work is the reality in itself it is not the illusion so b goes out unfortunately tolstoy is aware of his own limitation again the positivity of bailey the positive that bailey has used is not reflected in this option it says tolstoy is not aware of his own limitation the limitation point has not even come in the in 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 what what bailey has to say d says although tolstoy works casually and makes unwarranted assumption many people would feel like marking d and i will tell you why d is wrong 
right? Look at E. Tolstoy's personal perspective make his work almost unintelligible to the majority of. Now, unintelligible means difficult to understand. But again, Bailey has not said a single word with respect to whether you understand or not. So when something is not given, don't try to mark the answer. Unintelligible is a fancy word. It means difficult to understand. But where has Bailey said in his quotes that Tolstoy's work is difficult to understand? So even E has to go out. Now we have only two choices. One is A and the other is D. Some people go with the word unwarranted resumption and then inexplicable appearance of truth. He works casually. But look at what, what Bailey has to say. Bailey says that he means, so. so, so this is what Bailey says. It comes here. It says uh, he's impressive and then uh, uh, he stands apart from the other Western writers in his identity with life, which is so complete as to make us forget that he's an artist. He is the center of his work, right? And he says to also his simplicity is overpowering. He, he is his casual assumption that the world is, so there is a casual assumption of Tolstoy. And what is that assumption? That the world is as he sees it. So I assume that people are what they appear to be. That is my casual assumption. And casual assumption has become in the option works casually. So the assumption is casual, but he's not working casually. And instead of writing casual assumption, you have said unwarranted assumption. So all these are, you know, hodgepodge options. Tolstoy is having a casual assumption that people are what they seem to be. And you have said it's unwarranted. Unwarranted means not required. And then you say he's working casually. So what you have done is you have distorted the option. But option A says that Tolstoy and his work are the same thing. His egocentricity is of a special kind. He and his work are the same thing. And that's the reason he maintains no self-conscious distance. So option A is technically the correct choice. Because it is not distorting what, what Bailey has to say. Option D, on the other hand, is completely distorting. To make a casual assumption is not doesn't mean that you are working casually or you, you are making an unwarranted assumption. So you should know the meanings of the words first of all. And the what is reflected in the op, in the word is not what the what the court has to say. Unwarranted means not required, not 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 wanted, not desirable. But casual is not casual. Basically, means straight away without any kind of regard. So when you say that he casually thinks that casually basically means without any kind of thoroughness. But again, you know, working casually is a different thing than casual assumption. So or D is again, and his work has inexplicable appearance of truth. Of course, the work is def definitely truthful, but works casually and unwarranted assumption, they have been completely swept. D is not the right choice. A is the right choice. Fourth option says the author states that Tolstoy's conversion represented. So if you go and check the passage, you will get the answer. Tolstoy's conversion represented what? So it must have come somewhere in the passage. If you look at it here, uh, the famous conversion. So the famous conversion of his middle years, movingly recounted in his confession, was a culmination of his early spiritual life. That means the conversion in his middle years was basically the climax of his early spiritual life, not a departure from it. So, so when you say that it was a culmination, it was basically the climax. So the conversion was the climax of his early spiritual life. So what did it represent? So it, it uh, the option clearly says it represented what? Not a fundamental change because it is not about writing style. It is not about writing style. See, when it is not coming, it is not coming. You don't say that writing style. Where is, where is, where is the author said that the conversion is with regard to writing style? The conversion is with regard to his spiritual life. So you have to just make uh, rule out E, the acceptance of religion which he had, but it was the culmination of his spiritual life, not a departure. So if, he, if there was no departure, then there was no rejection. So again, D goes out. So the natural outcome of his earlier belief, why? Because earlier he was spiritual and the conversion was the culmination. That means it was an outcome, it was a result, it was a consequence, it was a conclusion. So C is precisely what the, that, that, that has to say. The rejection of avant-garde ideas. Avant-garde means revolutionary. And uh, again, avant-garde ideas, rejection is not what, it, it is concerned with religion and with belief and not with among our ideas. The radical renunciation of the world. His conversion was not a radical renunciation. It was not of the world. Again, you the way you threw out rejected, similarly you have to throw out, because rejection means uh, not accepting. But the author there says it was, it was not a departure, it was an acceptance. 
so why could you say it was a renunciation which again means some kind of running away from the world so option c is the best choice it was a natural outcome of his earlier belief take the next question according to the passage tolstoy's response to the accepted intellectual and artist, artistic values of his time now it is clearly given at one point in the passage that what was tolstoy's attitude towards the accepted intellectual and artistic if i if i scroll it here you will find that uh, it clearly says that others were awed by napoleon others believed that a single man could change the destinies of nations others adhered to meaningless rituals others formed their taste on established canons of art tolstoy reversed all preconception and in every reversal he overthrew the system so others were forming their taste on established rules of art tolstoy was reversing it tolstoy was throwing it out that means tolstoy was a kind of rebellion or he was a kind of rebel so what is the answer uh, he uh, he upset them why because he is definitely you know overturning them destroying them throwing them out so we can definitely say he is upsetting them he is not combining neither is he selecting so either he is upsetting or is he rejecting or he is subverting them but the point is subverting is not with respect to new political viewpoint the political viewpoint has not even come in the passage so d goes out he rejects the claims of his religion to but he is not rejecting the claims of his religion he is upsetting them because he wants to be faithful to his own experience others are going by what is established and what is the rule what is established over a period of time but tolstoy says that no i have to be faithful to my own experience and it is, and, and the passage says so if you scroll it up here then it clearly says that uh, that uh, tolstoy reversed all preconception and in, a, in in every reversal he overthrew the system right the machine the externally ordained belief the conventional behavior in favor of unsystematic impulsive life of inward motivation and the solution so he wanted to be independent so it's not about religion it's about independence of thought and you have to pick the choice depending on that so where is independence of thought faithful to his own experience so you will not have the same words coming in the option you have to be very careful with respect to that e is the best choice and then you have the the sixth one it says it can be inferred from the passage that which of the following is true of war and peace now you have to go to that part of the passage where the word war and peace has come the word war and peace has come only twice once it towards the start and then again it has come somewhere in between so towards the start it says war and peace uh might have been vast silent this is where war and peace has come and then again war and peace has come here right it says here that the apparently fundamental changes that led from epic narrative to dogmatic life from a joyous buoyant attitude towards life to pessimism from war and peace to croes came from the restless so the fundamental changes means what from this to that that means initially tolstoy must have been a joyous buoyant and later in his life he must have become pessimism initially he must have written epic narrative later he must have written dogmatic parable so at the initial stage of his life he must have written war and peace later on he must have written croesus sonata that is why th there are changes from this to that so can we infer that war and peace must have come towards the early part of his life and croesus sonata must have come towards the later part of his life that's what we can infer and that is what the option has to say if you go to the question it says here that war and peace belongs to an early part of tolstoy's work why because if the if the author says that uh, the fundamental changes from this to that from x to y that means uh, that war and peace must have been uh, the epic and then croesus sonata must have been a parable because from this to that basically means this is the start and then two comes to this a later part and it belongs to an early period of tolstoy's work then people would say that it has a simple structural outline what is this structural outline war and peace is, is masterpiece it's a great thing it is it is simple but structural outline is i mean structural outline is simple so you you, you are focusing on the wrong thing it it is simple it has it has simplicity in it but then structural outline is not what what, what the author wants to say as if the outline is simple structural outline is simple the other things are not simple so it is not what this we can't infer see then ironic view so all these go out the best answer is a why because it belongs to an early period of tolstoy's work there are fundamental changes in my writing from x to y from this to that that means initially from x must have come at the start to y y must have come later on that is the answer 
So overall, a difficult passage because because the language in which the passage has been written it seems to be easy, but the options are really subtle. They are, the the words have been completely changed in the options, and you have to be very careful when you mark the choice.